So we had uh, wrapped up our discussion of uh, standards and we'd started having a quick look at the um, liquid part of the steel making. Uh, because there, there are a number of things you should know um, about this in relation to um, the qualities, the internal quality of steels and, um, and some basics like when do you alloy the steel, you know, at what time exactly and, and why. Um, so we um, had um, we'd already made some headway. Um, the number of things that I um, added to the original file that was on the, um, the website for the class. Um, and so let me go through them first. And so, um, as if you prepare for the quiz next uh, on Thursday, please uh, look at the uh, E-class material because I, I slightly changed the slides. I added some material, actually quite a lot of material uh, that I thought might be relevant. So first of all, just for your information, um, uh, the blast furnace uh, is, is usually separate entity from the um, steel plant yes and so you and you basically carry the um, the liquid steel uh, from the uh, blast furnace to the uh, steel plant with these uh, torpedo ladles or you also have um, charging ladles this style yes uh, which and, and both of them are usually mounted on um, uh, rails uh, travel on rails through the plant um, one of the things so that happens with the the, the the iron as you move it to the steel making is there is a pretreatment and uh, this pretreatment is very important because that's the place where you are going to remove the sulfur. Yes? So remember, um, we usually like steels with very low sulfur content unless we want to make machinable steels. Yes? The place where we remove the, steel, the, the sulfur to get very low sulfur level that's actually the hot metal treatment, okay? And that's done with uh, calcium and magnesium. I'll, I'll give you more details about you know, what happens to the calcium as you add it, but basically you inject calcium and magnesium uh, in the liquid metal, and you also add lime. So CA, uh, CaO, calcium oxide, right? And so, so the equipment looks like this. For instance, here you have a, a ladle uh, transport, and um, this is the injection station here. And uh, calcium, we usually uh, use calcium carbide instead of um, pure metal calcium in this case, but we do use magnesium. Okay. You form um, slag that, and, it, and, and then you remove, you have to remove the slag before you go to the steel plant, right? And this is what you see here. Uh, first of all, the reaction, calcium carbide reacts with sulfur in, in the uh, metal to form calcium oxide. And, oops, this should, uh, yeah, two times uh, uh, carbon and of calcium sulfide, excuse me, this should be calcium, please correct this error here, calcium sulfide plus two times. Okay, you don't have this slide at this stage, but um, this is calcium sulfide. And, um, um, or direct uh, uh, reaction of calcium oxide with 
the sulfur to form calcium sulfide. Right, so let me just uh, make sure I got this right, because I think the first. So the first reaction, you can, you can form uh, calcium sulfide plus two times carbon. So that's what it should be. Yeah. But you can also have calcium oxide from the lime plus sulfur, calcium sulfide plus oxygen. Yeah. And this stands for oxygen in the, in the metal. But, but this is an error here. This would be calcium sulfide. And, and you see that, um, so as you add uh, calcium uh, carbide, calcium oxide, or this um, alloy of aluminum and calcium and silicon and calcium, you, you can reduce the amount of sulfur to very low levels. Yes? And the time it takes is about 20 to 30 minutes. So that's the time for the treatment. All right. Okay. So this metal, as we said, uh, then is uh, put in the uh, basic oxygen steel making. We already discussed what happened there. Just added this slide so you have um, maybe a better visual picture of how the process actually happens. So first you start by adding scrap. Mm -hmm. um, this scrap is added uh, to, uh, uh, for temperature control, um, also to um, avoid damaging the uh, refractories in your uh, furnace. And here you uh, pour the metal, yes, then you blow, yeah, you blow. You uh, remove, uh, you, you, you tap the, the when, when, you're, when you're done, you, you tap the metal, yes. You can then make additions, you make your first additions here, alloying additions, yes. And then you remove the, the slag, okay. So about these alloying additions, hmm? Uh, so let's, for instance, look at uh, manganese. Yeah? So d depending on the steel grade, some, some steel grades don't need any manganese additions because we, you know, we're happy with a, a tenth of a percent of manganese. Yeah? But if we want more, for, for constructional steels hmm? or higher manganese steels, so the, this is the moment during tapping where we, where we add the manganese. Yes? So most alloying additions will occur at tapping. Now, very often um, the uh, demands and the tolerances within which steel is produced in terms of composition are very, are very narrow nowadays. Yeah? And so we do what's called composition trimming. Yeah? So once you have measured um, the uh, the rough composition of your steel, yes, you do the trimming, so that's the exact uh, uh, alloying um, in the secondary metallurgy, okay? And that's um, uh, th th basically the main subject of today will be to try to convey to you the importance of secondary metallurgy to make in steel making, you know, some aspects that are relevant to, to steel products. Okay. Right, and this is an example here of, of this secondary metallurgy. So, so you, you don't do anything in the, in the BOF. You add alloying when you do the tapping, and then you do the trimming in the secondary metallurgy. And the, and the secondary metallurgy, you'll see, is usually uh, carried out in some kind of ladle. Yes. And we have. Um, some quite advanced techniques to uh, add uh, alloying elements, for instance, protected additions. For instance, there is this uh, method called composition adjustment by sealed argon bubbling. 
combined with oxygen blowing. So you, uh, you put a um, vacuum system yeah, over the, uh, or protection system over your, your, your metal, and that's where you, and you add the alloying here in, in controlled atmosphere. Or um, another method is to, uh, to use a cord wire, it's a wire basically, in the center that you have your alloying, uh, the ferro alloy you want to add, and you put it through a guide into the liquid metal. That's another, uh, and, and so it, it's protected against the environment. So you can uh, get very accurate um, alloy addition. Again, there are many techniques, uh, many uh, technologies for uh, BOFs. We're not going to go into it. Nowadays, most of the BOFs are equipped with uh, top uh, oxygen lance and bottom stirring. And there may also be some oxygen uh, through the bottom sometimes. Yeah? Um, we also discussed the fact that um, the BOF is basically a reactor where you remove a lot of elements, yes, mainly carbon, yes, silicon, uh, manganese, yeah, and also this is very important phosphorus. We, we, we know that phosphorus is just like uh, sulfur, a, uh, an element that we don't like to have in our steels. It doesn't mean that there are no, no steel grades where we don't add phosphorus. These exist, but in general, we will try to remove the phosphorus to very low levels, about 100 ppm. And this is done, it's actually done during the BOF. And um, during the late stages of the BOF, when you finish removing the carbon, yes, and you're, um, uh, you're uh, starting to oxidize your iron, because that's, that's when you get the right slag composition for the removal of phosphorus. Also note the fact that in the BUF you don't have to add any, uh, any heat because the, reaction, the, 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 the removal of carbon, silicon, manganese is very exothermic, so the, the temperatures go up very high. Okay, so there are two elements that are of importance in the uh, BOF. That's the slag and the metal, yes? And they, these are very different phases, we'll see. So the composition of the metal changes and the composition of the slag changes during the, the blowing, yeah? And uh, so what we see, uh, we see that towards the end of the blow, you start to um, uh, have increasing amount of FEO in the slag. And that's what's, and, and this combined with uh, lime additions is very efficient for phosphorus removal. Of course, there is some loss of, of iron in this case. Okay, so, um, how do I want you to think about the, the slag? Slag is basically an ionic solvent, yes? Whereas the metal, the steel, is a liquid alloy. Hmm? So what is of importance in the slag? There are two things, are, two properties are of importance. Hmm? Um, it's acidity or basicity, yeah? and uh, it's oxidation potential. Hmm? So. The acidity or basicity is related to the ability of um, the slag to supply oxygen anions. Hmm? For instance, a basic slag readily supplies anions, and so that's the case for lime. Hmm? A uh, acidic uh, slag, which is rich in SiO2 or P2O5, yes, will do the, the reverse. It will take away hmm, um, anions, oxygen anions. And you have also have neutral slags, of course, which contain um, both uh, lime and silica. And then oxidation reduction potential is another property, yes? And that's related to the ability to transfer oxygen 
from the steel to the slag, yeah? or, or from the slag to the steel via iron oxide. In the liquid alloy, we also have reactions, but these are usually precipitation reactions, yes? And when do we have precipitation? When, when, we, uh, when we have the temperature-dependent solubility, when we reach this uh, temperature-dependent solubility of a compound, the compound will precipitate. So, so if I have manganese and sulfur in solution, nothing will happen until I reach the solubility limit. And, and when, um, when it precipitates, it forms a solid particle. When C, uh, carbon and oxygen, uh, when you uh, cross uh, the solubility limit, I'll form a gas, yes? Okay. All right. Okay. So um, you don't need to, to know this in all in, in very great detail here. This uh, is probably covered in a course on metallurgy. But what I do want you to remember um, that the carbon is removed with oxygen. Yes? So that's... Yeah. Um, and we, we have to remove large amounts, eh? about 45 kilos per ton of steel. Yes? And we eventually want to end at 500 ppm, that's where we, you can end, 500 ppm of carbon. You know? Take our, um, uh, with plus or minus 100 ppm. So you'll have 400 to 500, 600 ppm of, of carbon typically. And the reactions are very simple. It, and the first one is the main reaction, is the formation of CO. And then the CO react into CO2. But the removal, the removal of carbon from the, the steel is, from, is by CO reaction, right? So the phosphorus, again, um, is removed in the, uh, uh, via the slag. Um, we need to oxidize it. It's also a very simple reaction. The phosphorus is in solution. I oxidize, I form PO2, yes? In the presence of carbon, yes? it gets reduced again. Yeah? So that's why we cannot start removing phosphorus until the end of the blow when the, f the carbon content is low enough. Yes? And then it's also important to remove the P2O5 to the slag. Hmm? And, and that's being done. This is, for instance, the, re the total reaction here. Phosphorus, FeO, CaO forms this uh, compound in the slag plus five times iron, okay? Carbon, phosphorus, temperature, these are important, three important parameters here. Hmm? And we'll see um, that, uh, as I said, we do reach high temperatures, but the temperatures that uh, we need to have at, at the exit of the steel plant are very well defined also, and, and so we'll, we'll need methods to heat and cool the, the, the liquid. Hmm? So we'll, we'll need to make temperature adjustments in the steel plant. All right. right, manganese, silicon uh, are easily removed to the, to the slag and sulfur, as again, as I said, that's usually done via hot metal desulfurization. I do want to say that removing phosphorus, yes, most uh, um, steel makers remove it in the um, in the steel plant in the BUF. There are some steel makers, in particular Japanese steel makers, which remove phosphorus in the hot metal. Yes, that's another practice. Okay, I won't go into that. Um, let's concentrate on on the important things here. Okay, um, so. Let's talk about deoxidation now. So we've, we've, we've blown a lot of oxygen on our metal that contains carbon, yes? And we have a very high temperature, yes? 1600 degrees C. Hmm? Uh, so um, we, uh, again, as I said, 
we only need to consider CO because CO2 is, uh, is not really relevant in the uh, BOF, it's not formed. So we need to look at the equilibrium of carbon and oxygen, yes, um, as a function of temperature and the pressure, pressure, the partial pressure of the CO gas. Yeah? So, and, and what we have is basically a solubility curve. So, and you know the solubility curve, if you plot, you make a plot of x direction carbon, and y direction the oxygen, you get a curve, yes? And this curve tells you that if you have a steel composition, so a carbon and an oxygen in solution in the steel, that's in this yellow range at 1600 degrees C, the carbon and the oxygen will be in solution. If we're above this, yes, CO will form. Yeah? C CO gas will form. So say we have uh, a melt yes, that contains, uh, say here, uh, this much uh, carbon, this much oxygen, then the composition of the steel will move along the stoichiometric line to this point on the solubility curve, yes, and this amount of oxygen will form CO, yes, but the rest will stay in solution. So I will be left, for instance, in this particular case, with 500 ppm of oxygen and 500 ppm of carbon, yes, okay, and when the temperature drops, this line will drop, yes, and I will form CO. This cannot happen because, say, you take this steel with 500 ppm oxygen and 500 ppm carbon and you pour it in a, in a mold, yes, it will start cooling and then CO will form, yes, because you will cross the solubility line and your steel will start to bubble, yes. So you will be unable to cast it continuously. You cannot do continuous casting because your material starts to be, we say the material is effervescent, it bubbles, you know, the CO comes out. So you need to, uh, to remove oxygen and carbon. Yes? So you start by deoxid deoxidizing the melt. Hmm? So you, you need to remove the melt. Okay, because this is the best you can do with carbon. Yeah? That's the equilibrium. All right, and of course, what you do, yes, um, is there are two things you can do. Um, first of all, you could say, well, let's see what is the effect of the pressure. So if we reduce the partial pressure of CO, yes, we can reduce the uh, uh, solubility. Yeah? So that's one of the things you can do. We don't really use this. Hmm? At this point, in this, in, after the steel making, we don't use this. And you can see why it's, why it's so difficult, because um, if you say you, you decrease the carbon, you increase the, the oxygen content, yes? And vice versa, if you decrease the oxygen content, you increase the carbon content, right? And you basically want to have both very low, yeah? or at least controlled, okay? Right, so, um, so we can do this, yes? We can reduce the, uh, uh, the pressure, yes? What we actually do will work in two steps. We'll do first a deoxidation by adding elements that are very uh, reactive, for, like to form oxides, such as aluminum, silicon, and or manganese, yes? We can reduce it, yes? But when you reduce the amount of oxygen, we're still left with carbon in solution, yes? And that will be taken care of in another step in vacuum treatment, yes? So we do, you know, very important here, the, the oxygen is removed by adding deoxidation uh, 
additions, uh, alumina, silica, silicon, excuse me. And the uh, final reduction to get very low carbon contents, we will use vacuum. Hmm? Right, okay. So let me first uh, talk about the deoxidation, right? Removing oxygen by adding alumina. Yeah? So first of all, at 1600, um, one bar of pressure, deoxidation with CO. That's the solubility line, okay? Okay, now if I do, if uh, this is now, it's not carbon, right? This is uh, now, uh, well, it, it, uh, silicon and carbon and, and aluminum also, right? So now I add silicon, mm -hmm. you can see the solubility is lower. Mm -hmm. This is carbon in uh, deoxidation with carbon at, in low vacuum, yeah? I can do this. But the best is, of course, you can see aluminum. You can see how, uh, what the solubility is of alumina, yes, in your metal. So that's why, obviously, that's the choice, right? We don't need vacuum. We just toss some alumina in our, our melt. And gone is the oxygen that could have reacted with the carbon to, do, to make my steel uh, uh, effervescent. This process of adding aluminum to uh, your, your liquid metal is called killing. Kill, you kill the steel. So you, um, uh, you avoid making these bubbles that will uh, that make the material difficult or impossible to cast. Yeah? Okay, so, so, and, and that's why we very often speak, talk about low carbon aluminum killed steels. But that's almost saying nothing because most steels are aluminum killed, right? Well, not really. Hmm? Some steels are also silicon killed, but we'll talk about this in a moment, all right? So, so here we pick up uh, again with the, uh, the electric arc furnace where, where we had uh, already uh, introduced um, on, on Monday. Hmm? So that, again, here in the, in the steel plant, we also have uh, steel making unit, which is the electric arc furnace, and then a secondary metallurgy, uh, which we will discuss in more detail. And I think we had uh, already um, looked at the typical mass balance in and out of a electric arc furnace, and obviously it doesn't. It comes as no surprise that in this case uh, you you introduce about a ton of scrap and you get about a ton of scrap out, right? So you, you don't make new steel here hmm? in an um, a, uh, electric arc furnace. It's basically a scrap-based route. Yeah? Again, um, saying that it's only scrap that you can process in an electric arc furnace is not 100% correct. There is, first of all, a large variety of scrap on the markets, you have what we call shred, yes? Shred is the highest quality sh scrap. It usually comes from car makers, yes? Excuse me, it comes, it comes from recycling cars, yes? Um, very low carbon in general. Then we have bushing, yes? That comes from car makers, you know, all the, all the steel that they don't use, you know, because they cut off uh, parts of, uh, that are not being used in the construction of automobiles, yes. Um, also very high quality, yes. Then we have plate and structurals. So when you, uh, when you scrap a boat, for instance, a ship, you know, all these plates um, are, uh, are scrapped and um, go through to electric arc furnaces, yeah. Bundles, and then we have things that look more like the stuff we're used to. Um, hot bricketed iron, which is iron ore plus additions of 1 to 2 percent of carbon. You have pellets. Pellets is also ore, yes, that's pelletized, yes, formed little balls that, is, that are uh, pre reduced, yes. Um, direct reduct, reduced iron can be used, or also pig iron. So, uh, you can feed 
into an electric arc furnace um, material that comes out of a blast furnace. Yeah? Okay. Um, depending on the products you make, yes, there will be requirements for the scrap, hmm? and in particular, um, residuals. And the residuals are elements such as copper, nickel, chrome, moly, tin, yes, which, um, depending on the application, have to be uh, low. In particular, if the uh, applications are in the auto or automotive ac applications, you want very low um, um, residuals. Hmm? But if you want to make, uh, for instance, rebar, hmm, that these are the, the reinforcement bars that you use when you, um, in connection to uh, um, cement, yes, to make concrete <coughs> for, for construction of buildings, there the, 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 the uh, requirements are very much uh, less in terms of residuals. Okay? Right, so this is basically repeating some of the things that have been said. Okay, so now um, we, um, we've had hot metal production. We've had this primary steel making either in the electric arc furnace or in the BOF. And we see that in the BOF, I listed all the reactions that occur there. They're basically oxidation reaction. You remove elements, yes? What we're going to talk about now is very important. That's what we call secondary metallurgy, yes? Secondary metallurgy or secondary steel making or also ladle metallurgy, yes? And you do a lot of things there, yes? And that's basically where you make the quality of the steel, the composition, yes? The internal um, Cleanliness of the steel is achieved there. We'll see what that uh, entails. And then the temperature. The temperature is, may not be so important for products, uh, but you'll see in a moment that it is. Um, but you need uh, specific temperatures to achieve casting. Okay. All right. So let's see. So the secondary metallurgy, so the, the, the met, hot metal pretreatment, BOF converter, that's, that's steel making, yes? So what comes afterwards between the BOF converter and the continuous casting, that's what we call ladle metallurgy or secondary metallurgy or secondary steel maker. And there are um, steps, yes? processes um, in this secondary metallurgy. Yeah. Argon stirring, vacuum treatment, heating, and inclusion modification. Yes? These are the, the, the most important steps. Yes? You don't always have to apply them. Yes? Basically depends from product to product. In this case, we'll just go through uh, go, go through them as if uh, the product needed them. Uh, so, what does the argon stirring do? Yes, it's used to homogenize the metal, the liquid. Yeah? Uh, and what do we homogenize? Well, we homogenize temperatures and we homogenize compositions. Um, We'll also see that this, the argon stirring helps the removal of non-metallic inclusions. Yeah. So it also has a, a, a cleansing effect. The vacuum treatment is used to do carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen removal to very low levels, to the PPM level. Okay, so. Then we can do adjustments of temperature in the um, heating part, yes? And we modif we remove and modify inclusions, non-metallic inclusions in the, the so-called inclusion modification steps. And 
that's usually referred to as the calcium treatment. Yeah? Okay, and then when the metal has the right composition, the right cleanliness, and the right temperature, it's ready for casting. Okay? After that, you will not ever be able to remove non-metallic occlusions. You will never be able to change the composition anymore, okay? Okay, so it's, it's very critical. This is really a really critical part of the products. Hmm? Uh, these, these um, um, a ladle is basically, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's, it's basically a container, right? It's, uh, but it's, uh, these containers, these la ladles, are uh, uh, pretty complex in, um, in secondary metallurgy. Um, so they, they look like this on the um, exterior. So you, you have a, a, a refractory lined uh, 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 container basically, right, with, um, as, uh, on which you can fit a cover, and the cover has openings for electrodes, so you can do some heating. You, there's openings for oxygen blowing, there's, um, you can do alloying by, for instance, wire injection, like we saw. You can um, uh, add uh, other elements via a bunker and a chute, yes. Of course, if there are gases formed, you can, uh, there is a, a fume hood here, yes. Um, you can um, also bubble in uh, gases, argon for instance, and you can have some powder f uh, elements added in the form of powder. Hmm? Refractory lining, of course, yes. And at the bottom, we can, uh, and the side, you can bubble in argon to stir the, uh, the metal. So it's, it's homogeneously, um, the temperature is homogeneous and the composition is homogeneous. And in addition, you remove non-metallic inclusion. And then you, you have a, a sliding gate here is used to tap to remove the, uh, the metal. All right. Okay, so this is a view here. Let's have uh, a. Uh, so so what, what you input, you, you have electrodes. You, this is also a place where you do a lot of sampling, yes? Uh, this is a wire feed rod here. This, these are the chutes where you can do alloying, and you have sensors for temperature, etc. Right, so let's first have a look at um, what happens in, for instance, a uh, vacuum, uh, vacuum metallurgy part of the secondary metallurgy. So you, this is not necessarily applied to all the steels. Yes? It's only applied to the steels where you want to have ultra low carbon levels. Yeah. So, um, Right, so the, there are two uh, types of um, vacuum uh, treatments. One is uses this um, uh, vacuum uh, degasser, yes? So you put this, con this vacuum chamber into the, the melt, yeah? It has two pipes, one pipe here and one pipe on the left. Yeah? And uh, so you pump, pump it vacuum. Okay, the, um, in one of the uh, legs, in one of the tubes, yes, uh, you, the refractories are porous and you blow in argon here, so the little argon bubbles. So what happens is when the, the density of this steel is lower than this steel, yes, and as a consequence, this works as a pump, yes, this steel goes up and it comes in the vacuum chamber and goes down this way. Yeah? The, the, because you reduce the, the density of the steel by just having small argon bubble in it. Hmm? All right, so and this is called a snorkel. This, this, this process is called a snorkel. Hmm? So in the, uh, in the vacuum, yes, we have basically reduced the vacuum. So the reaction 
of C uh, carbon in solution plus oxygen in solution gives me CO, yes? And I can uh, further remove the, uh, the carbon. Hmm? And I can use the uh, additional oxygen here to uh, reduce this CO level even further hmm? with oxygen to form CO2. Um, because you have nicely controlled uh, atmosphere here, you can also make alloying additions in the, at the same time. Hmm? Right, uh, and, and you also have argon stirring, um, and you can do um, aluminum killing at this stage as well. Hmm? What I, I'd like to um, point out is that the carbon levels can be as low as 10 ppm. Yes? And the nitrogen levels usually are, are low, 20 ppm. Um, the other technique is a tank degasser. Here you, you put the, um, uh, the ladle into a container, yeah? a vacuum container. Yes? And, and that's where you pump the vacuum. Yeah? It's a little bit slower, yes? And as the conventional tank degasser is basically a vacuum container, yes? And at the bottom, you, um, you bubble argon to, to mix the steel. Hmm? You can also uh, do a deeper decarburization by doing oxygen blowing. And this is what it looks like in, uh, in practice because the process is slower. Usually, people have... Uh, use two tank degassers in tandem, yes? Uh, this is used a lot because it has lower investment costs in comparison to the, um, if I want, the, so this, this degasser here is called the Ruhrstahl Heres or RH degasser. It's a very um, uh, industry standard. And this, this is what it looks like in practice. This is a standard RH degasser. And this is one where, uh, with an oxygen lens. Hmm? Okay? So the bubbling is only in one of these legs. Huh? Otherwise, it doesn't work. And so the levels of um, uh, carbon that you can achieve are typically 10 and below with an RH degasser and with a tank degasser, about 20 ppm. But that's already uh, very nice for many um, applications. All right, so we, um, uh, we need to uh, go back to the process of um, deoxidation. Hmm? Because uh, with the deoxidation, with uh, alumina, we have uh, created an issue, and the issue is that of non-metallic inclusions. Yes. So, right. What are we talking about? The the, the main uh, worries, yes, with uh, non-metallic inclusions in steel products, is are usually related to MNS. Yes and Al203. Yeah. Why is that? Because if we don't do anything about these particular um, non-metallic inclusions, we call them non-metallic because this is a sulfide and this is an oxide, yes? Yes, we form this, these MNS um, precipitates, and they're very big, yeah, they're, uh, at grain boundaries in my cast structure. And in the cast structure, I form Al203 dendrites. Yeah. Okay. When this material, if we don't do anything, and we roll this material, this MNS, these form very flat and long stringers in the microstructure. Yes. And the Al203 forms small broken groupings of crystals, Al203 crystals in the microstructure. And so what we will, what 
and you'll see in a moment why we do this. We want to change this. First, I'll show you what is bad about these MNS and AL203 particles, and then I'll show you what we want. So what we'll want to do is we want to modify them into rounded, small, rounded compounds, yes, which usually look like calcium aluminates with a ring around them of calcium sulfide or and manganese sulfide. Okay. Why don't we like these uh, compounds, these non-metallic? Well, first of all, we don't like them because they give us production problems. Production problem number one is clogged SENs, submerged entry nozzles. So a submerged entry nozzle is when you pour the metal out of the uh, ladle into the caster, yes, yes, the, um, you go via an intermediate uh, liquid container here, yes, and then into the casting, the, the, uh, the caster, yes. This tube here, yes, is called, it's a refractory tube, it's called the uh, secondary, excuse me, submerged entry nozzle, yes. And um, the metal has just to flow through it. It turns out that if we have these inclusions, these inclusions will form deposits. This is a nice tube, yes. If we have deposits on this tube, you can see here, yes, the tube will gradually uh, be pinched off, be clogged, yes. And so the flow through the tube will be very unstable, you know, and, uh, and that will give you very serious casting problems, yes. Unstable uh, metal flow and, um, and, 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 and uh, so you want to avoid this. I'm going to s uh, skip this slide because the, uh, so one of the things that it, these non-metallic inclusions have is they, have, they can have big impact on failure of the materials, hmm? the steel material. For instance, this is a wire, a steel wire, yes? And, um, and you can see it's a very small steel wire. It's made, it's, a, it's wire cord, yes? And it's broken, yes? It's broken by fatigue, and there is here at the tip, there is a non-metallic inclusion, yes? So for wire products, and in particular wire products that are um, used, for instance, for tire cord or for valve springs, for springs that are, uh, you know, that are in uh, fatigue, test, you know, uh, operate in very um, harsh fatigue conditions, uh, you want to avoid these non-metallic inclusions because they will give you premature failure, okay? So that's a reason to uh, avoid them. Let me just go. Oh, yes. Um, so in particular, you want to avoid the alumina, these hard alumina inclusions. And, and one of the things you do for these particular uh, wire rod products is instead of using aluminum killed materials, you, you're going to use what's called semi-killed, yes? And there the, you, you remove the uh, oxygen, not by adding alumina, but by adding silica, silicon, yeah? Um, uh, so no clogging problems. And the inclusions are liquid. So that means that at the moment you're casting, yes, you don't get solid particles that attach themselves to the nozzles, yes, and form uh, and, and clog the tube, yes? Okay. However, the steel is said to be, we, we make dirty steel in the sense that, if I can show you the next slide, yes? So if you look at the amount of oxygen in the steel as a function of the 
amount of uh, alumina or silicon. You see that for, for silicon, this is the line, yes? and for alumina, this is the line. That means that even though I add very small amounts of alumina, I can get extremely low oxygen levels. Yes? And that's typically if you um, get an aluminum killed steel, you'll see there will always be three to 500 ppm of aluminum in your composition. Yeah? That's the reason. That's the deoxid aluminum deoxidized. Yes? Very low ppms of, uh, yeah, of uh, uh, aluminum. If you deoxidize with silicon, yes, even if you add 1% of silicon, so a lot more than this, you still have 50, 10 times as much oxygen in your steel. So that's why we, we these um, semi-killed, we call them semi-killed because it's not really fully killed, yes? We call them also dirty steels. It's not because they're dirty, it's just because um, you know, there's, there's more oxygen in it, okay? But in many cases, we will, pr well, not, sorry, in certain cases, such as uh, valve springs, tire cord, yes, we absolutely want to avoid these very hard alumina particles, and, they, and we will use um, silicon killed steel grades. Yeah? Good. Another example um, forming defects. This is in a can. You can't see the can, but this is a can. It's been deep drawn steel can, deep drawn, and you can see here that um, the fracture, the, the can has fractured, yes, and when uh, looked at, uh, the fracture is analyzed, um, we see a nozzle clogging uh, uh, inclusion in the can. So inclusions are very important when the, the, the steel we use is either has a very uh, small thickness or a small diameter because then one particle can, can destroy, the, one uh, alumina particle can destroy a wire, yes, because it's, it's in the section, yeah? or um, uh, alumina particles can uh, destroy, give early fatigue, fracture of a spring, yes, it, it, you don't need to have many. Hmm? So that's why we um, need to do something about these alumina inclusions. Another thing, and that's related to the MNS, yes? Um, one of the things we like to avoid uh, is, is a combination of two things. It's a combination of a banded microstructure, yes? And high aspect ratio inclusions. A high aspect ratio inclusion of these. And this is typically MNS, manganese sulfide, because manganese sulfide um, uh, is a plastic compound, so it deforms very easily. So when you roll a material, it gives you a very long, a high aspect ratio inclusion. Yeah? And that can give rise to what's called lamellar tearing. So you have to imagine you have a plate with these uh, compounds like this, yeah? and then you weld this plate. Yes? You weld this plate. Um, and when you weld this, uh, certainly the, the plates are uh, thicker, yes? You, you can get very important shrinkage stresses, yes? And, and close to the heat affected zone, yes? Mm -hmm. And when you get these shrinkage stresses, these act as tiny internal cracks, yes? And you can get very easy what's called lamellar, lamellar tearing, yes? So the, the, these um, inclusions will act as nucle nuclei for, for small cracks, okay? And of course, you don't like that at all, right? So the sulfides, the uh, lumina particles, we need to take care of those, yes? Okay, so, um, but they're by no means the only uh, precipitates. Huh? And uh, in, uh, in steel uh, uh, business, we talk about type A, B, C, and D. 
inclusions, non-metallic inclusions. So the type A's are sulfides. Type B's are oxides. Type C are silicates. And D are globular, right? It's basically all the rest, if you want. Yeah? So the type A's are, for all practical purposes, it's, it's basically MNS. And they are plastic. They will deform plastically in the metal, for instance, during um, uh, rolling. Type B are oxides, usually alumina oxides, and they're broken and angular, yes, because they, they form these um, um, uh, larger particles which, which are broken during a rolling. Uh, C are silicates, in particular manganese silicates, are plastic, and the mixture or complex mixture of calcium, alumina, and manganese, magnesium oxides are uh, globular. And, and so these will be the type D precipitates, the kind of precipitates that are okay, and type C, the silicates, are also okay. Yes? So the bad ones are type A's and type B. Hmm? Um, one of the ways, uh, let me just go, right. Um, one of the ways we remove um, inclusions is simply by argon stirring, yes? So in the metal, yes, in our ladle, we, you remember, we often inject this argon gas, yes? So the argon gas makes basically bubbles, yes? And uh, so it stirs the metal around, yes? So uh, particles can attach themselves to these bubbles or be carried by the flow and get into contact with the uh, slag. Yeah? And, and there the oxide is, uh, is captured by, the inclusion is captured by the slag. Yeah? Okay. Now what's very important is that when you have a small, yeah, a small diameter particle, so a 25 micron non-metallic inclusion, yes, its uh, speed will be about uh, a quarter of a centimeter per second, yes, if you don't do anything, yes. So it'll take you, it'll take about uh, 20 minutes to go three meters, yes. Okay. Okay, so this tells you that if, if you didn't use argon, yes, and you, you just let the steel wait there, stand there for 20 minutes, a particle here, alumina particle here of this size, you would manage to get it, it would float, because it, it, these are oxides, so their density is lower, yeah? um, it, it would basically float to this slag, yes? But if it's a large particle, yes, uh, um, it goes faster, okay? But removing the tiny particles becomes critical, right? And that's the reason why the argon uh, stirring helps. Okay, so argon stirring. That's one way of removing the occlusions. The other thing we do is we are going to modify these inclusions. We're going to turn them into something else, yes? Okay. And we do this by adding calcium. Look at the, this is the phase diagram of calcium oxide and alumina, yes? And you see that at around 50% of alumina, we have a low temperature eutectic, yes? A low temperature eutectic that is below the temperature of casting. That means that the compounds here, yeah, the compounds here, if, we, uh, if I can get compounds with this composition, they will be liquid when I cast. So they will not form solid particles that can attach themselves to the uh, inner uh, tube, yes, and cause clogging. Hmm? 
So how is this done? Well, it's simply, instead of uh, making, uh, uh, having only alumina, we make alumina and calcium compounds. And they have names Ca6, Ca2, Ca1, yes? Basically, C stands for calcium and A stands for alumina, right? So Ca1 means CaO, Al2O3, yeah? okay? Okay, so the richer this compound, uh, the richer we can make the, uh, the, the, the modified oxide in calcium, the lower its temperature, Mm -hmm. and the, um, the better the castability will be of the material. However, we have to watch out. If we, in if we add too much calcium, then we will form calcium sulfide. Yeah? And calcium sulfide is also bad, yes, because it will cause erosion. Yeah? It will destroy the, uh, the refractory by um, abrasion and erosion. So then um, I'll create more uh, um, in non-metallic inclusions. Um, recently it was found out that um, if these compounds, in addition to containing uh, calcium, also contain magnesia, MTO, the temperature the, the melt temperature is even lower, so MTO contributes to liquefaction. Hmm? Okay? Right, so these um, uh, inclusions can be identified. So this is an example here. This is a ladle inclusion. It contains, it's basically spinel. It's MTO Al2O3. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not been influenced by uh, calcium. Um, this is a, you can see uh, small particles here. This is uh, calcium sulfide. That's also not good. You don't want calcium sulfide because you can see it also creates these particles. This is an inclusion here of MNS. This, you can see a long inclusion here, continues there, yes. And you can uh, very easily, and this is a calcium, uh, this particle here is calcium aluminate. You can see it contains aluminum, calcium, um, yes. All right, so see this is an example here of uh, manganese sulfide, very long, yes. And because they're so long, yes, these corners here act as crack tips, yes. All right, this is an example here of a inclusion here, you see that the center part of the inclusion here is a spinel, is a MgO Al2O3, yes, and that due to the alumina addition, it's now coated with a, um, a calcium sulfide uh, uh, layer, yes because this, the reaction, the, the modification of this, uh, your alumina or your spinel is, is via a solid state reaction. Hmm? So you very often see these compound oxides. So this is an example here again, spinel on this side and here alumina on this side, okay? Okay, so how, how is this done in practice and what happens in practice? Well, we basically add metallic, metallic calcium to our bath, is, one, uh, is how we can put it, yes? Uh, so it's, it gives a very violent reaction and most of the calcium is evaporated, yes? Yes, and uh, it's got a very low density, it's a very low density metal, so you really have to use special techniques to get it into the metal, yes? Like um, cord wire, for instance, yes? Yes, and, and it it's very quickly evaporates. Remember, the metal is at 1600. The boiling point of uh, calcium is at less than 1500, right? So um, it's, it's going to be... Um, uh, difficult to keep it in the, in the steel, right? And it has very low solubility, 
and we actually it's kind of difficult to measure and there are different reports high or low um, okay so the the type of addition the way you can add it is is at uh, as a um, uh, calcium carbide yes or carbonitride they th these compounds have very low volatilization because they're not metal yes uh, and, and we use them when we do desulfurization of, of the hot metal, remember? But in, usually in steel making, we use uh, binary or ternary alloys of, that contain calcium, yes? Uh, as a form of a wire or a cord wire that is, is poured into the, uh, into the liquid metal. So of the calcium we inject, yes? We inject this through this pipe, yes? Yeah. Most of it evaporates, yes, most of it evaporates, and some goes into the, the metal, yeah, and, and so what, what happens there? Calcium is very reactive, yes, and it's, it's um, so what, what happens with it, it will, well, first of all, some of it will go into solution, yes, and then it will react with sulfur and with oxygen first. That's basically what, it ha what happens first, yeah, and then these two compounds will react with the alumina or with the spinel, yes, to modify them. Yes? So they'll form a coating around this spinel, a coating around this, and then and slowly modify these solid compounds into calcium-rich compounds, which, which will have a low temperature. Okay, so, so this is just, um, uh, so, so you can see the, why you form calcium sulfide and calcium uh, oxide very quickly, you know, because it's, it's very stable. You know? and, and also, when, when you add uh, calcium to the melt, instead of forming MNS, you form calcium sulfide. Okay, this is, so it's also very efficient in, in, in terms of uh, removing uh, the sulfur. Um, again, I'm not going into uh, the details here, just want to uh, make sure that you understand that this um, removal of non-metallic inclusion is complex, yes? And uh, uh, you have to add just the right amount of um, calcium, yes, so that you have, you're in, in, in the ternary, you, you liquefy your, uh, your non-metallic inclusions and, and, and you don't have any um, uh, 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 nozzle clogging. Hmm? If you have, if your composition is, is very rich in calcium, in particular calcium sulfide, then you also have a problem, yes? because these, the, the calcium sulfide will cause very strong abrasion of your, no, your, your nozzles, yes? And that will give you another type of inclusions. Hmm? Okay. And, um, the, w and it's also important to realize that when you add the calcium to the metal, yes, um, actually the first types of particles you form are calcium sulfate, calcium uh, oxide, right? So, and it's only after, you know, after the treatment has, uh, after the, the, the calcium oxide, calcium sulfate have reacted with the oxide that you, you, you make, you start making the liquid um, um, non-metallic inclusions. So it, it does need some time, yes? And this is very, I think, um, for um, uh, people that are in, uh, in steel metallurgy, it's still a very active area of uh, high temperature research because uh, the reaction is very complex, yes? Uh, so at the beginning, we have our particles. Calcium and oxygen will react with these particles to form Calcium illuminates, yes, the calcium illuminates will become richer and richer in calcium as time goes, yes, and, yes, um, eventually they'll become liquid, yes. 
The, there is a secondary reaction where we form, we can form calcium sulfide solids, yes? If um, the calcium levels are too high, for instance, yes? Okay. Temperature control of the steel, that's pretty simple. Why do we want the temperature control? Because we want to have uh, stable uh, casting conditions, all right? So what will affect the steel temperature? Well, when you tap, you, uh, when you, you go from the basic oxygen furnace to the ladle, you lose temperature, about 60 degrees, yes? Um, when you add alloying elements, they'll be solid. So in general, that gives you a temperature reduction, not always necessarily a reduction because there may be uh, heat of dissolution. Yeah? It can be um, uh, exothermic dissolution, but in general, we have um, a temperature decrease when we add alloying elements. And of course, there are natural heat losses. Yes, if you do, yeah? And the temperature drop is about half a degree per minute. And finally, you also have argon bubbling. When you ar bubble the argon, you stir the metal around and you lose temperature. So that's a, a parameter you always keep an eye on, on the temperature. Hmm? So most modern steel plants have models, so they know what the heat loss is so, um, during secondary steel making, and they can take actions if the temperature is too low or if the temperature is too high. Hmm? So let's have a look. What can they do to adjust the temperature? Well, we can have arc furnace, uh, uh, ladle arc furnaces. It's basically uh, a, a, a ladle on which we can fit a, um, a top which has electrodes which will heat the, um, uh, the metal basically via uh, an electric arc, yes? So we, we can, these are not very powerful uh, systems, so you, you can increase the temperature four degrees per minute, three, four degrees per minute, yeah, at full power. You can do chemical heating, yes, and the trick is to add alumina to, um, and so you, you inject uh, uh, oxygen and you put in alumina. Uh, right, so obviously this will heat, when the oxygen reacts with the, the aluminum, you, you will heat the steel. Obviously, when you do that, you introduce uh, uh, alumina particles, which you have to remove afterwards. Yeah? Okay, so this um, is not um, used very often, yeah? it's prohibited when you make very clean steels. Okay? You can decrease the temperature. Obviously, uh, simple ways to do uh, argon bubbling, yes. About half a degree per minute you lose, yes. Uh, when you just hold it, yes. Um, and you can make scrap additions. So you select uh, high quality scrap you know the composition of and you just uh, put it, add it to your uh, metal to, um, to reduce the temperature. For instance, cooling rate is um, about a degree if you add one kilo of scrap to a, you know, about 200 tons of, of steel. Okay? So you can heat, you can cool, you, you do have to take the temperature into account. All right? And then you're ready to do the casting. Okay? And, and we'll stop here. Uh, and we'll continue um, with um, continuous casting in, um, on, um, on Thursday morning. Thank you.